I'm playing a new bass for the first time. This is um, a Brubaker bass, but I put some um, design features into it. Very beautiful instrument, and um, hopefully um, you might go to market with it one day. It has um, some interesting features like a tone control, volume controls for each pickup, master volume. This is the master volume, and an off and on switch. So if you want to do something on stage, you can cut it off and don't have to worry about it going through the house. I thought it was a good idea. Um, the first thing um, we like to talk about is the role of the bass in terms of what this is what I have to offer you, and I hope that it's been um, beneficial to all of you what I have to present to you today. Uh, myself and um, master musician Steve Ferrone. You can't call um, Steve just a drummer, you know. In fact, you can't really call any drummer just a drummer, because usually they're the best musicians in the band. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, I, I'll give you that 20 bucks later. All right. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to hold you to it. <laughs> um, so let's start off uh, with the idea of, okay, here we are. We're going to make some music. Uh, this is what I do. My... Um, <clears throat> My forte is improvisation. Um, when I was um, made my name in the studio, they called me because they wanted to hear something different as opposed to what the normal thing was to do. And um, this appealed to a lot of producers, a lot of artists, and a lot of fellow musicians. Um, one in particular note, Jaco Pistorius, um, who got into my playing. And it basically comes off of the um, idea of rhythmenting the harmony and the melody. So now I'm going to um, march along with Steve. Um, you know, give me a little um, eighth note beat. So, I'm going to tell him the tempo. He knows what I want. <laughs> OK. Now you hear his bass drum? I'm going to mess around with his bass drum in the key of A. So the idea here was to not duplicate what he played, but play a part that would fit with what he played, basically, sometimes being with him and sometimes dancing around him. And then you add in the, uh, the idea that he's playing rhythm. So my job is to add a little harmony to his rhythm. So I call what Steve does, in a sense, rhythmic drive. And when I call what we do in terms of making notes, harmonic propulsion. So it's the sequence of notes that give the meaning, the, me the meaning to the feel of the music. So if I'm playing something. He, rem he, rem 
remember it. What I'm going to have you though, now you heard what I played. You probably can remember it. Okay, so that's one, that's one part. Now, if I want to simplify that, um, give me the beat with that now, Steve. Three. What I did was I went from full time to half time to space time. Something to that effect. And these are the things that we have to work with in terms of composing our parts because in reality, we're actually composing um, a sub melody to the melody. Now the only um, drawback here is that I have freedom to play anything I want to play. It doesn't matter what the melody is or what the, even the subject is. But when it comes down to it, when you're creating music, you want to have a goal, so to speak, in terms of what's the purpose of the music? Why am I here? Um, what is this music going to be used for? Um, who is it going to be used for? Um, according to my book, It's called There's Music in Everyone. But um, I went back last year and decided I'm going to write a book called The Bass in You, which is basically the same book, but it just features, features some things that would apply to just bass players like fingering. But these concepts that I'm talking about are basically universal for all instruments and all styles of music. And I'm going to take the moment here to read to you um, the groove and its 10 components. You bear with me while I read this to you? Okay. Okay. Number one is the type of music, the style and instrumentation. Okay? Type of music, style, and instrumentation. Um, style usually comes with culture, different parts of the world, different parts of the um, have different styles, and also the instrument changes reflects that um, that's used. Um, number two is the time signature or meter, the basic beat of all the styles. Number three is the tempo and the feeling of the music. Four is the vision of that basic beat or the basic feeling of the groove. Now when I say division, that means two part division which we just played, bottom, 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 two part division as opposed to a shuffle, da 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 three part division or four part division, one the end, the digga And at some point in time, you might put them all together, which um, more than likely that will occur. Um, to maintain the groove initially, you want to stick with in the rhythmic grouping that you decided to agree to play upon. Um, I mentioned rhythmic drive before, the heart and soul of the groove. Um, the next part of it is phrasing, the art and skill of playing 
and I have here, row, row, row your boat. So I guess I gotta stick with row, row, row your boat, huh? Okay. <laughs> chord usage. <laughs> um, the dominant seventh chord. For example, that shows you where we're talking about harmonic propulsion, because now we're talking about a chord, and we're talking about the fact that we have instruments playing these um, on, off of these chords based upon the scale that you're in, or the key that you're in. Harmonic propulsion I mentioned before was the um, act of um, calling chord progressions or harmonic motion or melodic motion, create movement. And then the tenth aspect, the ninth aspect is dynamics, the foundation of the groove. And the tenth is listening and learning, call and response. So these are the things that make up the groove, basically. Our ability to access these things to turn, depend upon our, what we've done to get there. We have our, our skill set, what skills we have, what techniques we employ, what knowledge we have, our creativity, and our technique. These are the, these are the things that we can kind of like, are tangible things. Then you have the intangible things like your commitment, your passion, your compassion, your mental fortitude, and your physical endurance. So when you put these things together, you're able to come up with a package or a presentation that is completely unique to you and your experience. And this is what you really want to, um, I believe, as a musician, we want to strive to be able to make our own music. And these are the elements I've found and the components that make it possible for us to actually focus in on these areas to achieve our goals. It's important to have a, a way of means of getting to that particular point you want to get to. So, at this point, do we have any questions? Did you uh, demonstrate what you were talking about with that row, row, row your boat thing? You <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> okay. I said it, didn't I? Okay. Um, let me uh, switch instruments. I'm still getting used to this instrument. That's the, this is the amp I started on back in the day. This is all you saw in the studios, B-15. We have to drag our, drag our own amps around also back then, unless you were joined to the, um, the bass club. But um, me and a few guys, we had our own club, so we had our own little stashes of amps at different studios. That worked out pretty well. But um, Okay, row, row, row your boat <laughs> in the key of C. <laughs> See, give me a um, New Orleans beat. About here. Like a uh, funeral march. Your, your New Orleans style. Now, let's take that. We're going to go through. I'm not going to stop this time. And um, Steve, I'm going to follow you. Oh, I can play anything I want? Yeah, you can play anything you want. We're gonna, we, go, we did the New Orleans thing. We're going to do a rock thing. We're going to do a blues thing. We're going to do a jazz thing. And a calypso thing. Okay, we're just going to take four. Okay. But, and we're going to do this for the purpose of... Um, I don't want to get bogged down in the head trip, but um, you have to just imagine wherever you want to think you want to be when you hear this, okay? <laughs> We're not making the commercial. <laughs> There's no video to look at, so. <laughs> Yeah. 
The advantage of playing a song with changes is that you don't have to think too much. You follow the changes. Um, one of the hardest things to do is actually play one change and make it interesting, which is, um, we did a lot of that last night, come to think of it. <laughs> <laughs> Willie was a genius. <laughs> you know, He was able to take that one idea and expound upon it and give you um, what I call a, almost like a call and response effect, where you have one line going against another. Just like when we first started, I had Steve marching and I was dancing around his drum beat. Um, it's always about having a separation of parts. You have a drum line, you got a bass line, you have a guitar line, you have a vocal line, you have a horn line, you have a string line, you have sweetening parts. So it's a matter of putting these ideas together to come up with a complete package to tell your story of the moment. So we're going to go, um, let's give us a blues approach to the same um, this idea. With the, uh, let's go with the shuffle, Steve. Yep.
I'm sorry about that one string. <laughs> So the idea of playing different styles, it's what makes you, um, broadens out your ability to create um, within a style and also to um, bring that style to an original composition, um, such as playing, making this nursery song into something that you would dance to, something you would romance to, something you buy a car to, whatever it was, you know, you want to make it fit that particular picture, get the picture so it's uh, appropriate. Did I hear you making something I'd romance to? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we can do that. Slow down to about 40. <laughs> you're not serious, are you? Yes, you are. Give me a little ballad groove. A what? A ballad groove. A ballad. Slow, yeah, slow. Oh, yeah, yeah. children be made as a result of that, but um, <laughs> let's hope for the best. They come out all right. <laughs> okay. Um, next thing I wanted to discuss was basically, uh, I'd like to share with you, if I should put it this way, and this is open to questions, or if you have any uh, insight that you want me to share with us. Um, the role of the bass in today's music and in music in general. Um, people ask me, what do you think about, they ask me, what do you think about music today? And I say, it's, um, it's changing, like people change, times change, and um, there's, there's good and there's bad. Um, there are many artists out here trying to you know, stick true to traditional music and people trying to change the envelope. What I might hear was, was um, Charles Mingus, and he is the um, consummate composer, musician, arranger, band leader, and he um, heard music a different way, and he, I was attracted to his style of music. Um, I still am. Um, he's the one who's um, given me the, the direction and sense of goal in terms of what I can do, the possibilities that are out there, and there is, there is room for new ideas. Um, so in today's music, the role of the bass has become, become more wider than it was back in the day. Um, where that it's become almost the lead instrument. The songs are written around the bass, partly because you can hear it now, where you couldn't hear it back in the day. <laughs> you know, you know, it was there, but you could just feel it. Um, so now that it's become a, a more vocal instrument, you make it, you realize, realize how powerful it is. It's the most powerful instrument in the band, and the softer you play it, and the deeper you play it, the more profound I believe the influence is in terms of the music. Um, in my music, I try to 
you know, instill that and also in terms of making people aware of this idea of the role of the base. We're both, we're leaders, we're followers, we're policemen, we're groupies. We do whatever has to be done to make the music solid and keep it in the pocket or take it out of the pocket and also to make it develop and grow because music is supposed to expand. It's not something that's going to be this, you do a one chorus and you loop it and you repeat it and you repeat it and repeat it. No, it should be each level, each chorus should go up and it should also come down. Then it should go back. It, has to, it tells us it's a journey, in other words. It's not going to be straight ahead. There's not going to be any, there are going to be any, um, there are going to be curves. There are going to be mountains. There are going to be rocks in the road. You have to be able to negotiate these things. So with, with that in mind, um, this, um, this place up is Steve. Give me, uh, We're working it together. Uh, give me, um, give me a song of a of, of 16th note. We didn't do the 16th note thing, which is one of my favorites. I want to break that down. Um, You're going to have to play that. <laughs> we will. Memphis. Yeah. Oh, fuck. No. Memphis what? Memphis Stowe Studios. Is that what it's called? Yeah, yeah, okay. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Oh, I, oh, I love playing that. Um, um, but let me break down. Um, actually, um, it's funny um, you should say that. Um, back in my day, I say back when I came up, there uh, was no such thing as fusion, and we just made music. So the idea of playing what you heard, what you felt at a particular time was what we basically did. Um, I'm going to go back to Memphis Soul Stew, but um, let me, actually it's in the same, this is the same key as Memphis Soul Stew, so this is a perfect segue. Um, <laughs> Line. Bring it up to 16, Steve. Give me the 16s. Yeah. So once you have this, so I have a call and a call and a response, basically. The call was the bass line. That was the fill. A fill can be anything very short in terms of duration. So I put a fill in with my, that was my response. That's 
Now I'm playing lead-ins along with the bass line. Anything else I play is going to be a pickup or a lead-in to bring me back to the next phrase. So call and response is the trademark um, of what we do. We play one part, then we add another part. Then we add another part. And sometimes we're hearing parts from the vocal. We hear from the other people we're playing with. I refer to it as marching with the drummer and now dance with the singer, or dance with the soloist, or dance with the guitar. So you have these parts that kind of like weave in and out of each other, but don't get in the way, but complement each other. The idea is to make music that's going to be memorable. That's the key. You want to make it memorable. Um, I'm looking for questions here to um, keep me motivated here to uh, <laughs> share this information that I have with you. I hope you're finding it useful. Yes? Yes, Phil? Can you talk about the King Curtis and uh, Marita question and voices of the South? Oh, well, you know, you mentioned that to me. Um, what, you said that was an A flat, didn't you? Uh, could be. Could be. How <laughs> 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 oh, did you come up with those lines? Um, I mean, you know, just they're all your lines, yeah. You know, yeah. Um, you usually um, it's a mixed bag in a studio. You get a chord chart. Uh, sometimes you get a chord chart. Sometimes somebody was singing in your ear. Um, sometimes it'd be a full arrangement. It was up to you to determine what part of the arrangement you wanted to play um, that was suitable, because that's what they called you, basically, for you to put your style of music or your ideas into the music as opposed to playing note for note what the arranger had written out. Um, I found that early on that they didn't want that. You know, don't, 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 don't play the part. <laughs> no, no, that's, don't play that. <laughs> you know, play what you want to play. <laughs> you know? So um, my role was to take that part the suggestions they had and to um, rearrange them basically and make it fit the music at the t uh, music we were planning to re um, reproduce or create in the studio at the time. So a line like that, I think um, it's funny how a succession of songs, one thing will lead to another. The start of a session, you'll start with one song, you have four songs to do, and they all kind of like feed into one feed into each other. And you don't want to be repetitive. You don't want to play what you played on the first song or the fourth song. So each song has to be different, so you have to keep be mindful of that, that you're not gonna be um, repetitious in that fact. So coming up with that line was probably, um, was that for what it's worth? I think that was it, yeah. Uh, something like, yeah.
It was funny how things happened. I saw Phil last night, and Phil Chim, by the way, great bassist. He kept telling me about this. I'm saying, well, man, that's a, I don't remember. You know, it's like, yeah, okay, 1967, 68, whatever. So I haven't played it since then. I mean, this is like something you we go in and you make up something and you're done with it. But um, I like that. I'm glad it came back to me at some point. <laughs> now the other thing that I'm um, most associated with, I guess a lot of people um, want to know the background, maybe possibly it might be of helpful to you, you know, the background of things that happen. Um, but I'm almost famous bass lines from Memphis Old Stew. I did with um, King Curtis, um, live at the Fillmore West. And it was a, I guess it was the ongoing development of the original recording that was done with Tommy Cogbill, the late great Tommy Cogbill. Thank you, thank you. Um, Tommy Cogbill. Um, Tommy was something else. Um, anyway, he's not appreciated. He, um, a lot of people don't even know who Tommy Cogbill is, but he was the one who was in Muscle Shows before I came to Muscle Shows and before David Hood came to Muscle Shows. He was on all those uh, Wilson Pickett records, um, Memphis um, Sax records back in the day. Um, tremendous musician, great person, a great leader. Um, Tommy Cogbill, okay, he made the original bass line on Memphis Soul Still. <laughs> Which is basically a Latin Montuna. Um, you know, we all play, you know, <laughs> all kinds of music, you know. So. so this is how we started out with King Curtis, basically um, playing this this riff, and um, then it developed into a, a free for all, basically. <laughs> <laughs> that he would introduce each particular instrument. So I'm going to play a little bit of that for you. Um, I'm probably playing it faster than I should be. Um, I'm going to slow it down to... Um Today's special is Memphis Soul Stew. <laughs> we sold so much of this to be the run out. <laughs> but we got some more. I'm going to start with a half cup of bass. Thank you. 
All right. You know, people, a lot of people don't know, but Steve and I used to play a lot together back in New York in the 60s. Um, and I moved out here. I find him. I was so happy. <laughs> so happy. In fact, he's um, agreed to be a kingpin again with my band, the Jerry Jemai, the Kingpins. The new breed of kingpins. <laughs> um, so um, that developed out of playing the Latin rhythm, basically. And then the fills I added, which is basically syncopation. Um, and my approach was to either, I kept it simple. I made a point to um, keep this under control because we would play it for a long time. And so I, was something that was, I would find something that was ma uh, manageable. So I, I either go up or I go down. So I play ascending. So my other choice was a combination of both. Didn't play that one, but um, <laughs> that's a good one I can add next time. <laughs> be more of a lead-in, you see, that took, up, that took up too much time, so the idea was to play um, a fill, basically, uh, which we uh, two beat, uh, one, two, three, no, that was four beats, that was a lead-in also, that was a four beat lead-in, as opposed to um, two bars, but sometimes you want that dramatic entrance, which actually I used with Wilson Pickett when I played with him for the first time. Um, we had a session that bass player didn't show up for, and they called me in the um, in the morning and said, "Well, can you get down here as soon as you can? Because um, the bass player didn't show up." So I said, "Sure." So I went down to Atlantic Records and um, I walk in the studio and there's um, not quite as many as you, about 25 musicians who had learned their parts and sitting around, you know, reading the newspaper, waiting for somebody to show up to play the bass part so they can get on to the next session, basically. So I walk in and um, they show me a chart. And um, we look at it one time and say, okay, we're gonna record it. So I'm saying, well, here I am. This is the opportunity. The guy didn't show up. What can I do that's gonna submit my future here? You know, so it's like, yeah, this is what you do when you get this opportunity. And so um, there was this long space of music where it was this, uh, they had strings and it's called Deborah. If you look it up on the internet, you will find it with his band playing it, but they copied, this, they copied the same arrangement we did. So what it was is this long languid, um, acapella type intro, very Italian, it was for the Italian market. And so um, I just had this, it was a two bar space of music on my, on my page. I said, well, I think I can do something. It was a, going into a tempo change. It was a set up the tempo change. So it went from Deborah, blah, 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 blah. And then there was this whole pause where they had nothing on the chart to do, but there was a tempo change notice. So I said, okay, I'll play. Um, and went to the line and said, Wow, that was that was it. That made it for them. <laughs> that made the whole thing work and it's kind of cemented my um my legacy with Atlantic Records. Um that was my first time actually working there. Um but you never know when the opportunity is gonna come and but you have to, you know, recognize that you can do something that's going to um not only make the music good. I did it for the music really. Um, in retrospect, I was thinking about what's going to make this music work at this particular point. And so I said, oh, I can play something. And they went for it. <laughs> you, know? <laughs> you know, so um, that's the story with that. Yeah? Jerry, uh, tell us about your sessions with the Rascals. Oh, oh they were um, they were a joy. They were a joy. Um, they didn't have a bass player in the band. It was just organ, um, piano, organ, guitar, Felix, um, I forget, Cavallari, the, um, I forget the, um, having a senior moment here. I remember Felix from me, but I see, I see them all the time. I see Eddie, Brigatti. Oh, Cornish, Gene Cornish. Gene, thank you. Um, they were great to work with. Um, it was an open book. And Arif Mardin was there making the, um, running the session, the uh, art arranger, so. It really made for a comfortable experience um, having you know his direction. The whole um, 
working at Atlantic was really wonderful, and those guys were really great. They were, really had a, a, a sense of social consciousness, also a music sensibility was basically rhythm and blues. Um, so we had a great uh, relationship. And they hired many great musicians besides myself um, who um, played on their um, records, like Richard Davis, Chuck Rainey. Um, they just get the cream of the crop um, to work with them. Jocko on his video. And uh, thank God it was you. I think it was very coherent video. I thought it was really informative. And uh, I was just kind of wondering how that all came about. It seems like I could hear some of you in his playing. Well, thank you. Um, he was he admired my playing. Excuse me. And he sought me out. Um, actually, a friend of mine, uh, in fact, I you know, he, um, at the time, I met someone on tour who knew him, and when he came to New York, he hooked us to go, He hooked us up, and we began teaching together um, at Sounds of Joy Music, and we discussed what we wanted to do in terms of sharing what we had gotten, what we had learned, and with, from our lives with the, um, the kiddies. He said we we're going to leave something for the kiddies, so we worked on this project for three years. Actually, um, we started in '84, we finished it in. Um, either 86 or 87, I'm not sure. I think he passed in 87, so we have to finish in 86. Um, and um, we were dedicated to getting it done, basically. We had a lot of opposition along the way. Uh, they wanted somebody else to interview him. He said he wouldn't do it without me. And then they tried to incarcerate him so they would make sure he showed up for the session. And that didn't work. You know, so you know, it took three years to get this done. And um, when we finally did it, um, we went to the studio and they were naturally late to set up. You know, took a they were an hour and a half late in terms of getting us started. But we started and once we started, we finished two hours early. Uh, so <laughs> that was our um, dedication, and it kind of a culminated the three years we had spent together. And the night before, I had took a, taken a pad and just wrote down twenty questions that um, we had things we had touched on over the last three years, basically, and just read them off in that order to him during the interview, and we, before you know, we were out of there. And he was throwing his bass to Kenwood. <laughs> you know? But that was um, a day to remember, you know, truly a day to remember. And so many people have come to me and who only know me from that video, it's, it's incredible, and I'm really, appreciative of the fact that I was able to be a part of something that was so monumental because he left us a year later. You know, he was gone. You know, like so many others. What, what are some of your fondest experiences from back then? Oh man, <laughs> you got a couple of hours? <laughs> I can't, I, it's funny thing is I have to make some phone calls <laughs> to remind me. Um, playing with, um, I guess Aretha, the Rascals. Those, those. I did a lot of work at Atlantic, um, but then the other studios I worked in also was our were, were great. Um, Columbia. Um, just going in a session with people. I guess the fondest remember members I have is really coming into a session and working with people who I used to listen to on records. All my heroes, I, I was sitting next to, cats like Snooky Young, Garnett Brown. Um, Dick Hyman, um, Ed Shaughnessy, um, Gary Chester, um, um, Selden Powell. Um, so I came up, I came up listening to jazz, basically. Um, so um, I'm listening to big, the big bands, all the big band players were there, the Count Basie band members, the Duke Ellington band members, the, um, the, the Latin band members, Mongo Santa Maria band members were there, the Philharmonic was there. Um, Don, um, Don Sebesky, who was um, Rena Ferguson's arranger, um, somebody else, um, Harry Lukowski. That was one of my fondest memories. He was a um, violinist who made a record called Stringsville, and he took all the Charlie Parker solos and played them on the violin and the viola. Okay, with the rhythm section of um, Milt Hinton. Um, Milt was in the group, um, all star rhythm section. Um, and to sit in the studio with him was like mind blowing. And he was so humble and so 
sincere and honest, like as most of the people were that I encountered who I've been, you know, my heroes on the records. Here I am now, I'm working with these guys. You know, it was just, um, that was really it. I mean, the, the artists are one thing, the great artists, that's great, but the musicians I work with, I mean, it's just incredible. And of course, to work with Aretha um, during the same time shortly thereafter was uh, mind blowing because I looked at her picture at Columbia on the wall for years and just like drooled. <laughs> <You know? laughs> so it's like <laughs> to go into the studio and work with her um, shortly thereafter, um, unforgettable. Unforgettable. Um, I wouldn't, um, she tried to hire me, but I couldn't, um, I didn't want to leave the studio. I had fought basically going through a lot to get into that position to be in the studio. Um, I was in King Curtis's band, and he made the first Memphis Souls 2 without me as I reflected con Tommy Cogbill. You know, the truth is crazy. I tell you, when you tell the truth, <laughs> you know, so many good things come out. Um, but as a result of that, I left the band when he recorded the um, Memphis Soul Stool without me with Tommy and um, the guys uh, from Memphis. And so I left the band, but two months later he said, Jerry, um, he called me and said, you don't have to play in the band anymore, but just make my records. So that started my whole recording career. So I am um, you know, moving right along, working with um, all the greats, working with Aretha. And I couldn't, when she wanted to hire me, I said, well, you know, I came this far not to go out on the road. So, you know, I'm sorry, but I, you know, I, I can't do it. I, you know, I declined the job. Um, and I'm glad I did, because um, I got an opportunity to work with her four years later when Curtis called me again. He says, well, I know you don't want to do this, but um, I'm putting this band together with, you know, Cornell and Purdy and Billy Preston and Aretha, we're going to do this. And, he says, you know what I need. So I said, well, I'll think about it. So I, two days later, I said, okay, I'll do it. And six months later, he was gone. Okay, so I mean, you just never know. You speak of opportunities when they come. Sometimes you have to change your mind. You know, you might have a mindset, but um, it's good to be flexible. I try to stay flexible. Ed? Uh, Jerry, I hate to cut you off. We kind of have to wrap it up. Is there something that you could leave us Is that long? We've, we've been here that long? Time flies. Uh, wow. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Um, musically? Okay. Well, um, let me take that last question first. Maybe that'll lead me to what I want to say. Will that, who said somebody want a question? I just wanted to thank you for all your acumen, all, all the knowledge that you're sharing with us. Because it's, it's rare that we hear someone break it down to the way you're doing it. And we, we so appreciate it. Well, I, th I thank you for that. I thank you for that. Okay, let's do, um, how do I start it? Let me see, let's do some, um, ah, I wrote a Calypso for Steve the other day. He didn't know it, and I, I don't think I've remembered it either. <laughs> <laughs> I'm trying to, I'm trying to, uh, Calypso Ferrone, um, it's a one, six, two, five progression I'm gonna start with, okay? That's what it is, Calypso. Gonna be, I'm gonna mess around with the one six two five while you play a calypso beat, and I, it's on my phone. I have the documented proof. But I'm gonna probably make a new arrangement of it today, right now. <laughs> Hit it, see.
you all for coming. Once again, Steve Perone.